All free episodes of Addressing Gettysburg are brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. To become a sponsor, send an email to matt at addressinggettysburg.com. And to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg today. And we thank you in advance. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you all. Always appreciate you coming out for our winter lecture series. Um, my name is Christopher Gwynn. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And I'm uh, particularly grateful to see you all today for a subject that is a little bit more, I guess, obscure would be the best word. If, uh, you know, if I was doing a program on you know, Joshua Chamberlain or Robert E. Lee, I'd expect you all to show up. Uh, William Robbins is not that well known, though. Uh, how many of you are familiar with William Robbins? A few of you? Okay, a little bit. Well, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to do something I don't normally do with a program today, and that's, um, that's a, an argument. I'm going to make an argument to you all. I'm going to argue that William Robbins, the gentleman you see up on the slide, is the most important Confederate veteran you don't know about. <laughs> not in terms of the battle, not in terms of strategy or tactics. That's, of course, Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet and Richard Ewell. Not even necessarily... Um, in terms of the creation of the lost cause, uh, but in terms of how the, the battlefield at Gettysburg is shaped, in terms of how the Confederate story is told on the battlefield, in terms of the visitor experience that we still interact with in some respects today, William Robbins is monumentally important. And that's the argument I'm going to make. So I hope when you walk out of the theater in about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, you, you'll see what, what I'm saying. Beyond that, I think the story of William Robbins reminds us of a couple of things, especially in an age when we're having this national debate about how we remember the past, especially the Confederacy. The story of William Robbins reminds us that history is very messy and it's very complex. And a lot of times we want to reduce things down to very simplistic sound bites. Uh, William Robbins reminds us that that's not really how history works. William Robbins and his story, especially his management of the park, which we're going to get to, reminds us that history and memory are not the same thing. They're related, but they're not the same thing. And there's a tension that exists between those two things. And that, in part, shapes the, the national park that we have here today. William Robbins and his story is going to remind us that human beings are, are very complicated and they can be contradictory. His story is going to remind us that Human life is very fragile, and you'll see what I mean uh, when I say that. But before we begin, you know, who is William Robbins? Well, he's a Confederate veteran. He fights in the 4th Alabama. He sees service throughout the American Civil War. More importantly for our story today, William Robbins, between 1894 and his death in 1905, serves as a commissioner of Gettysburg National Park alongside two other Union veterans. And in that capacity, he's responsible for basically creating the battlefield park that we have today, the avenue systems, the towers that you see on the landscape, a lot of the tablets and War Department plaques that are still out on the battlefield today. A lot of that is the work of William Robbins. He is hugely influential in that regard, and he is tremendously influential in how the Confederate story is told on the Gettysburg battlefield. As we're going to see, William Robbins has a vision for how the Confederate story is going to be told here, how the story of the Army of Northern Virginia is going to make itself manifest on the battlefield. A lot of that is still out there. Some of it's not. And we'll see, we'll see what happens during Robbins' tenure as a, a commissioner on the park. In order to understand his time on the Gettysburg battlefield, though, both as a soldier and as a commissioner, I think we really need to go back to who William Robbins is, where he comes from, the, uh, the environment in which he grows up. So he is a North Carolinian by birth. He serves in an Alabama regiment during the war, but he is a North Carolinian. He's born in Randolph County in October of 1828 to Ahi Robbins, which is kind of a unique name. It's a biblical name, uh, roughly translates to brother or brethren, and Mary Robbins. He um, is a farmer. He's a well-to-do farmer. He grows up in a well-to-do farming family. This is not the planter class. So we're not talking about a big plantation, massive amounts of acreage. He's, he's 
well-to-do, but not of that level. He grows up. Um, he grows up in the shadow of slavery. So that's not a foreign concept to him. Uh, according to the 1850 census, and what you see up on the screen or in the slide is the slave schedule from 1850 for the Robbins family. We can see that they own five enslaved human beings, the oldest uh, a woman who's 40 years old. The other four are all children, uh, the oldest being a 16-year-old boy, the youngest only two years old. So there's a story there, I'm sure. But he grows up amongst the enslaved population. He is incredibly intelligent. William Robbins is a bright guy. He'll uh, go to Randolph-Macon College in Virginia. Uh, after that, he becomes a professor at a, a local college teaching mathematics. Ultimately, he'll end up moving to Alabama, where he uh, attempts to set up an all-female college there. Uh, that does not succeed, fails. But uh, he ends up translating his you know, professional career to law. In 1861, when the American Civil War begins, he is practicing law in Selma. That's where he is when, when Alabama secedes, when, when the call to join the, the Confederate Army is made. One of the themes of William Robbins' life, and one of the things that I think is going to shape and mold his worldview, is tragedy. And before we even get to the wartime experience that he has, I want to take a quick look at the tragedy that impacts his early life. So again, he's born in 1828. In 1842, when he's only 14 years old, his mother will die. And I, sickness, I, I assume. I don't know the exact cause. But you can't be a 14-year-old boy and have your mother die and that not affect you. He'll marry in 1853. By 1858, his first wife is dead. So again, a deeply impactful experience for Robbins. In 1862, between uh, the end of the Maryland campaign and uh, the beginning of the, what would become the Fredericksburg campaign, he loses a son, uh, Willie Lewis Robbins, who's only uh, six years old. And Robbins will set up a stone for his, um, his only son at a cemetery down in North Carolina. And it's difficult to see on the screen, but he inscribes on the stone, quote, my angel boy, which I thought was very touching. Um, his life will be marred by tragedy time and time again. And again, it's one of the themes that kind of weaves itself through his story. So the American Civil War begins. William Robbins is in Alabama, and he sets about organizing a company of light infantry. This is the Maryland Light Infantry, which will ultimately become Company G of the 4th Alabama. And the 4th Alabama is one of the fighting regiments of the Army of Northern Virginia. They see service from the Battle of Bull Run in 1861 all the way through to the end at Appomattox. The only real campaign they miss is the, the Chancellorsville campaign. They're with James Longstreet outside of Suffolk at that time, so they don't participate in that. But Robbins is there for virtually all of it. He's like the Forrest Gump of the 4th Alabama. He sees everything. At the Battle of Bull Run, he's with an earshot of Bernard B. when B gives Stonewall Jackson the famous sobriquet, Stonewall. He um, fights on the peninsula. See service at Second Manassas, Antietam, uh, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg. He's wounded severely at the Battle of the Wilderness. He's hit in the head by a um, uh, Union uh, mini ball, and it doesn't kill him obviously, but it severely wounds him. Takes him out of the fight until later that fall. He participates at the Siege of Petersburg and battles outside of Richmond. He's with the um, the Fourth Alabama as a major when they surrender at Appomattox. He also fights out west under Braxton Bragg at Chickamauga, and then he takes part in the uh, Siege of Knoxville. So this is a guy who is no stranger to the battlefields of the American Civil War. He, he's seen combat. There are a few battles that will, I think, stay with William Robbins. that will really kind of imprint itself on his psyche. One, of course, is the Battle of Gettysburg. So the 4th Alabama is in Evander Law's brigade. It's John Bell Hood's division. And on July 2nd, they begin the day 25 miles from Gettysburg at a place called New Guilford. They make a forced march through the night just to arrive at the Gettysburg battlefield. By the time they get here, they're physically exhausted. They're emotionally exhausted. Uh, they take part in Longstreet's countermarch to get to Warfield Ridge. And then they are ordered forward against the Union position at Little Round Top, arguably some of the most difficult terrain on the entire Gettysburg battlefield. They contend with what looks like to them a mountain 
with you know, Union troops at the top of it. They go up against the 83rd Pennsylvania in the right flank of the 20th Maine. It is brutal fighting, and in this one engagement, the 4th Alabama loses 93 men, killed, wounded, missing, captured. It is a brutal battle, and I can guarantee you that William Robbins, on July 2nd, 1863, as he's fighting in the shadow of Little Round Top, had no conception that in about 30 years he would be back at Gettysburg working for the United States government to preserve that hill. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Even more significant for Robbins is the Battle of Antietam, fought September 17, 1862. And in a lot of ways, the experience of Robbins and the 4th Alabama during the Antietam campaign or the Maryland campaign is indicative of the larger state of the Army of Northern Virginia in the fall of 1862. 4th Alabama is severely short on guns. They're understrengthed. They're undersupplied. There's a huge vacuum of command in the 4th Alabama. At this point, Robbins is a company commander. By the end of the battle, he's commanding the regiment. So huge vacuum in command. And for Robbins, the Battle of Antietam will be another you know, episode in his life where just profound tragedy happens. So first, uh, the morning of September 17th, the 4th Alabama is positioned in the, the East Woods, excuse me, the West Woods, just beyond Dunker Church, when a uh, Union artillery projectile literally strikes the head of a man that Robbins is talking to, spraying him and his comrades with bits of bone material, blood, brain matter. Again, you can't see something like that and not be impacted by it. Later in the day, along with the rest of Hood's division, they counterattack the 1st and 12th Union Corps, uh, see savage combat in the East Woods. And during that combat, Robbins' brother, Madison Robbins, will be shot in the neck and killed, literally in front of his brother. Um, and that's, again, just the start of the personal loss that Robbins will see during the American Civil War. So Robbins is actually one of six brothers, one of six. All of them will join the Confederate Army. And between 1861 and 1865, he'll lose one brother, James Lafayette Robbins, who's killed at the Battle of Gaines Mill. He'll lose Madison Robbins, killed at the Battle of Antietam. His body will never be recovered. Uh, more, often, uh, more likely than not, his brother is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery in Hagerstown, Maryland, in an unknown grave. It's a Confederate cemetery. He loses another brother at the Battle of Chancellorsville, fighting in a different regiment, not the 4th Alabama. Julius Robbins is killed at a nearly insignificant skirmish out in Kentucky. And again, his body is never recovered. He has one surviving brother, Franklin Robbins, who's severely wounded, captured, almost dies. But from the American Civil War, those six brothers go off to war, only two come back, William and his brother Franklin. So a profound loss of life in the Robbins family. And again, that's going to shape him. That's going to shape his worldview. And I'd have to imagine that in April of 1865, as William Robbins is beginning the long walk from Appomattox back to North Carolina, where he's going to try to rebuild his life, I'd have to imagine an enormous amount of, of I guess, bitterness that he must have taken with him. Um, I mean, I don't see how you lose that many loved ones in that short of a time span and, and not walk away with, with some sort of scar from that. The one bright spot during the war years is he will remarry uh, to Martha M. Robbins, who's actually the sister of his first wife. This happens in 1863. He, um, he fell deeply in love with her, deeply in love with her. And if you ever find yourself with some spare time, uh, I'd suggest you go to the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill website, go to their special collections page. They've digitized virtually everything that William Robbins wrote. They have his journals from his time as a commissioner at the park. They have wartime letters, uh, and they have love letters to Martha. Uh, you can read them. He's madly in love with this, this young woman. So what does William Robbins do after the American Civil War? Well, he returns to North Carolina, attempts to rebuild his life, uh, and eventually he'll become involved in politics. First at the state level, he's elected to the North Carolina Senate. By 1873, just a decade Following the Battle of Gettysburg, William Robbins is in Congress. He's elected to the United States House of Representatives, representing North Carolina's 7th District. 
and he'll spend virtually the entirety of that decade representing the people of his home state. Uh, which, again, I find an, it's an amazing thing about our American Civil War, that a decade before, individuals like William Robbins, who are doing their best to break away from the United States and form their own government, are a decade later, as federal reconstruction is falling apart in the American South, now finding themselves holding national office. But that's exactly what happens with William Robbins. We could probably do a whole lecture just about Robbins' time in the House of Representatives, but I want to focus on just one aspect of it, because I think it's uh, illustrative of kind of William Robbins' worldview before he becomes a commissioner for the park. He's involved in a lot of different things, a lot of debates, a lot of legislation, but one is really important to him, and that's the Civil Rights Act of 1875. This is a landmark piece of legislation in the late 19th century. It's essentially a, um, an anti-discrimination law. That's really what it is. It's introduced by Charles Sumner, uh, the famous Charles Sumner, who's almost caned to death by Preston Brooks in the you know, Kansas-Nebraska days before the war. It's um, designed to, as you can see, protect all citizens in their civil and legal rights. And it outlawed racial discrimination in juries, public schools, transportation, public accommodations. It is fairly forward thinking for the 1870s, and it's a response to the plight that a lot of formerly enslaved African Americans are facing in the South as men like William Robbins all of a sudden find themselves back in positions of political power. So Charles Sumner, this Massachusetts senator, as one of his dying you know, efforts, is trying to get this law passed. And it will. It will pass. Ulysses S. Grant signs it into law the 1st of March, 1875. It has a very short shelf life. It has a very short shelf life. By 1883, the Supreme Court will strike virtually all of it down. And then uh, not long after, the Plessy versus Ferguson case basically kills it. But William Robbins will spend a good chunk of time on the floor of the United States uh, House of Representatives arguing against this bill. Um, and in one, I think, particularly... Uh, vivid speech, he says, quote, Sir, the Negro, he's speaking to a Massachusetts uh, representative. He says, Sir, the Negro is a clinging parasite. He looks up to others as his superiors. He is an inveterate servant. Free him how you will. Enfranchise him as you may. He still waits for guidance and submits to command. And that he gives on the floor of the House of Representatives on the 24th of January, 1874. Now, this is not a particularly unique or novel uh, viewpoint in terms of racial attitudes in the American South or in the North following the American Civil War. And it's not my intent to go into William Robbins' kind of racial viewpoint, but I think it's important because one of the things that William Robbins is really going to try to champion at Gettysburg is this idea of reconciliation, of bringing the North and South back together. He's going he's to work his hardest on this battlefield to achieve that. But when William Robbins talks about reconciliation, he defines it very narrowly. This is a reconciliation for white people only, not for the four million people who were formerly enslaved in the South. So he defines it very narrowly, and that's the viewpoint he'll bring to Gettysburg. So he leaves office in 1879, returns to North Carolina, has a very productive uh, academic and legal career, and then out of the blue, according to William Robbins, he gets an appointment by Daniel S. Lamont, who's the um, Secretary of War uh, under the Grover Cleveland administration, to become a commissioner at Gettysburg National Park. So he's going to join two other men, and this uh, group of commissioners is going to be responsible for managing the Gettysburg battlefield as a national park. Uh, why, why is Robbins chosen for this? Well, he's a Democrat. Cleveland is a Democrat. Uh, they needed to achieve a balance of commissioners, north and south. And you know, Robbins was a savvy politically, certainly, um, Confederate veteran. He had a background in law, which was certainly helpful for the commission. So I think that's a big reason why he's chosen. But on March the 14th, 1894, Gettysburg gets a new commissioner. And you can't understand the Gettysburg National Park Commission without talking a little bit about how the battlefield itself is preserved. So, and most of you being Gettysburg aficionados probably know this, the preservation of the Gettysburg battlefield begins very early and not by the federal government. 
It's uh, begun by the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And this is a group of really influential local citizens who in 1863, even while the dead are being buried and the wounded are still being treated, this, this group of citizens recognized that something extraordinary had happened here. And they set about uh, creating this organization with the intent of creating a monument to the Union victory at Gettysburg. Their, uh, their idea, though, is not to create a monument out of stone or granite or bronze. Their idea is that the battlefield is going to be the monument. The hills, the ridges, the woods where the battle was fought. That is going to be the monument to this Union victory. That is going to be the tribute to the Union dead, this preserved battlefield. In 1864, the following year, they get a charter from the state of Pennsylvania to begin purchasing land uh, where the battle is fought. And that's what they start to do almost immediately. They preserve land on Cemetery Hill, on Culp's Hill, Cemetery Ridge, Little Round Top. It's really the genesis, the core of what is today Gettysburg National Military Park. But the goal of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association will be very different from when the park is managed by the federal government. The Battlefield Memorial Association, they're not interested in physical monuments. Like I said, the battlefield's the monument. And um, they're only interested in preserving land where the Union Army fought. Their charter does not give them the ability to purchase land on the Confederate side of the battlefield. And that's because their intent is not to create a battlefield park that a, uh, achieves a kind of moral equivalency between the North and South. Their goal is to create a Union Memorial Park. That's their objective. That's not surprising. It's 1863. It's 1864. The American Civil War is still being fought. Uh, you know, of course, they're going to create a monument in Pennsylvania honoring the Union victory. That shouldn't surprise us. What ultimately happens is, over time, the land owned by the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association and its leadership will fall into kind of disrepair. And Union veterans in the 1870s essentially stage a, a hostile takeover of the board of the Memorial Association to take it over. And they start to make improvements. They start to actively encourage Union veterans to come back to the battlefield and start placing monuments. And that's exactly what happens. By 1895, though, by 1895, the federal government is going to take over all that land. The GBMA transfers a little over 500 acres now to the federal government. And now the federal government is going to own Gettysburg National Military Park and steward it for the citizens of the United States of America. And it's going to be these three guys, initially, that are going to manage it. Now, again, you're all battlefield buffs. Do we all know the guy in the middle? John Batchelder, the first real historian of the battle. He's a New Englander. He arrives in Gettysburg in July of 1863, starts interviewing uh, veterans and participants, spends the bulk of his life studying the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's Batchelder that is really pushing for this to be a national park. And he also is increasingly interested in preserving the Confederate side of the battlefield, which is one of the charges of this commission now that the federal government is in control. They're going to start to buy up land on the Confederate side of the battlefield, and they're going to start to mark the lines of both armies in tablets with um, words that have neither praise nor censure. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's Batchelder. Of course, on the far right, Robbins, we all know him. How about the guy on the far left? John Page Nicholson, a monumental figure in terms of the creation of this place as a national park. He is a Union veteran, serves throughout the American Civil War, very influential veteran in Pennsylvania. He's um, involved with the creation of Mollus. He's uh, involved with the creation of, of the Pennsylvania Day at Gettysburg, where a lot of Pennsylvania uh, monuments are placed. He's going to be the chairman of the commission. Not Batchelder. And actually, Batchelder dies in 1894. And he'll be replaced by another Union veteran named Major Charles Richardson, who um, served in the 126th New York during the battle. But it's going to be these three guys that manage the park. And so what do they do? You know, what does a commissioner do? Well, again, they're responsible for basically all the things that the National Park Service is still responsible for today. They're going to buy land. They're going to negotiate contracts. They're going to condemn land sometimes when they can't get it through sale. They're going to write tablets, interpretive tablets, 
or uh, informational tablets on the battlefield, the same tablets we still see out on the landscape today. They're going to have to deal with wildlife. They're going to have to deal with recalcitrant locals. They're going to have to perform a law enforcement activity. Um, they meet with veterans. They meet with veterans all the time. And when I say that they do a lot of the same things that the National Park Service does today, in a lot of ways, the job they have is much more difficult and much more complex because they have thousands of veterans who fought here who have a vested interest in the place and who want to make sure the commission knows the right way to manage the park. They have a huge job. At every turn, they're reminded by the, the human carnage of the Battle of Gettysburg. I'll give you one story. William Robbins, the guy on the far right there, the one we're talking about, he spends a lot of time in Gettysburg. He'll travel back and forth to North Carolina every now and then, but when he arrives in Gettysburg, he gets a boarding house at the corner of Baltimore and Breckenridge, just down the, the road from Mr. G's, if you're looking for a landmark. Um, he spends a lot of time. Charles Richardson, that other commissioner, is sick a lot, so he's not really present. Uh, and then John Page Nicholson, he's traveling to Philadelphia and Washington all the time. So really, Robbins is the guy on the ground a whole lot of the, the time. One day, I want to say this is in 1903, a group of uh, laborers are working on behalf of the commission down by the Slider Farm, which is in the shadow of Big Round Top, and they're building a fence. And uh, the workers, as they're laying a post, all of a sudden dig up a grave, and they call William Robbins over. And so Robbins shows up, and they have the grave exhumed, and they lay the skeleton out, and they determine the body is a Vermont sharpshooter, one of the same men that William Robbins had fought on July 2nd, 1863. So imagine that. You're William Robbins. You're managing the park for the United States government, and you literally exhume a man that might have been killed by your command uh, a generation earlier. So that happens for this commission all the time. So they did serious work. They did serious work. Um, they had a lot of other challenges, too. A lot of the same ones the Park Service deals with, has to deal with today. Uh, and these are some gems from Robin's journal, which he keeps throughout his time as a commissioner. So on July 12, 1894, he writes, quote, made arrangements with Rosensteel to move his toilet shanty off the avenue. Well, some guy had his outhouse next to the park road. March 12, 1899, Jim Ross drove a number of cattle down the Carlisle Road to Howard Avenue, the animals badly trampling the grass. If you're ever bored, you can turn on uh, our park radio if you're ever in the lobby there. All the time, cattle gets out. All the time, and our law enforcement officers have to go chase it down. That resonated with me. Um, every day, I get either emails or voice messages or text messages from interpretive rangers or licensed battlefield guides complaining about how the grass is too high here, the vegetation, the little round tops obscuring the view. You know, one of the big challenges of the Park Service today is you know, trying to manage that. You know, sometimes we do a good job, and sometimes it's a real struggle. On June 22, 1899, Robbins writes in his journal, quote, I sent Colonel Cope, this is Emmer B. Cope, the engineer of the commission. I sent Colonel Cope out to Summon Area Ave to try a grass and weed killer. They used a pint of it. And then he has this French phrase that basically translates to, we'll see. We'll see if it works. So the commission bought this grass killer off of some you know, contractor or somebody trying to, trying to offload it. And they're trying to manage the landscape. It's what we still do today. A huge part of Robin's job is working with veterans. And because of the nature of Gettysburg, he interacts with Union veterans a whole lot more than he interacts with Confederate veterans. And a big part of the commission's job is approving the location, the text, and the design of Union regimental monuments that are placed on the battlefield. And you got to imagine, if you're a commissioner working for the federal government, and you got to tell a group of veterans that no, they can't have that design, or no, that language is not correct, I mean, there's a lot of conflict there. And Robbins will write about some of these conflicts in his journal. Um, one of the things he writes a little bit about is the monument to the 13th Vermont. Uh, and this is a picture of the dedication of that, that regimental monument on Cemetery Ridge. Well, the 13th Vermont, on July 3rd, 1863, had an officer by the name of Stephen K. Brown in its ranks. 
And Brown had been placed under arrest earlier in the campaign for a fairly trivial infraction, and they had taken his sword from him. And so when Pickett's charge begins, Stephen Brown is without his sword. Uh, he rejoins his command, uh, but he can't find any kind of you know, weapon to lead his men into battle. All he can find is a camp hatchet. And so many of you probably know this story. He goes into combat on the afternoon of July 3rd with his camp hatchet. And so the story goes, during the height of Pickett's charge, as there's hand-to-hand -hand fighting, he literally uses it to basically capture a Confederate officer and abscond with his sword. And it's all true. The veterans said that this happened. And so when the survivors of the 13th Vermont want to put up their monument on Cemetery Ridge, they want to have a statue of Stephen Brown waving his camp hatchet in the air as their, as their monument. Well, the commissioners saw the design and you know, one of their charges was to make sure the battlefield looked dignified. And according to Robin's journal, he said you know, the, the hatchet looked absurdly large. And so they end up having this kind of battle with the veterans of the 13th Vermont. And ultimately, the commission wins out. But if you do go and check out the 13th Vermont monument, you'll see that camp hatchet down by Stephen Brown's foot. So they, they snuck it in there. But these are the kind of battles that Robbins is waging with these Union veterans. A bigger issue is where on the battlefield can you place the monument? In the later years of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, they established what was called the line of battle policy. What that meant was you could place your monument, you can place it on the battlefield, but you had to place it where your, your unit formed up its line of battle. For the Union Army, that was, you know, not a huge deal because more often than not, where they formed their original line of battle is where they did their fighting. So go to Little Round Top, find the monument to the 83rd Pennsylvania, the monument's there because that's where their line of battle was formed. That's where they fought, that's where they died. More problematic with the Confederates, as we will see. But you know, a big part of Robin's job is managing these policies and rules of the commission, making sure that these monuments are in accord with, with federal policy. He helps a lot of veterans identify locations for monuments. One of the most famous is the boulder on Stony Hill, where uh, an aid station for the 32nd Massachusetts was established. And the surgeon would argue that it was the closest to the front lines of any established during the battle. And one day, Robbins goes out with the, the surgeon, Surgeon Adams, and they locate the boulder, and uh, Robbins approves the, the monument. So he did a lot of that. Robbins, in his dealings with Union veterans, was always very reconciliatory. He was very open about the fact that for four years he fought as hard as anyone to break away from the United States. He admitted that. But no one in the 1890s, working for the federal government, who used to be a Confederate, was as willing to move forward in a kind of reconciled fashion than William Robbins. And he saw that as one of his jobs on the commission. Again, provided it fit that very narrow definition of reconciliation. And, you know, he, the commission is making a lot of this up as they go. There's no rule book that they're, you know, delving into. There's no SOP, standard operating procedure, for how a commissioner is supposed to act. And sometimes that gets Robbins into a little bit of trouble with Union veterans. Uh, I'll give you one story. In the late 1890s, the veterans of the 32nd Massachusetts returned to Gettysburg and placed their monument near the wheat field on Stony Hill. It's that very cool one that looks like a, a shelter have, a dog tent. And Robbins, the day of the dedication, is the only commissioner in town. And he you know, doesn't know what to do. Should he go out and participate in the, the dedication? Should he hear the speeches? And he's not quite sure. He decides ultimately, since he's the only commissioner, to go out. So he does. He gets on his buggy, rides out to the wheat field, joins the veterans of the 32nd Massachusetts with their kids and their grandchildren and their wives for this uh, dedication ceremony. They sing patriotic songs and Robin sings along. He you know, shakes hands with the Union veterans and most of the Union veterans were, were very welcoming to Robbins. There was one pastor from a local church up in Massachusetts that was going to give the benediction. And you know, later, on, later on in the dedication, this pastor sees you know, William Robbins, former Confederate singing the Star Spangled Banner and you know, shaking hands with the colonel of the regiment. Uh, allegedly, this, this uh, pastor says to somebody next to him, uh, what does that fellow think he's doing being so free among us? And after the dedication, some Union veterans um, 
came up to Robbins and told him this story. And they said uh, to Robbins that they told the pastor, well, I guess he thinks the war is over. And Robbins is constantly getting into these kind of funny situations with Union veterans. His big, his big focus, though, is Confederate veterans and making sure that Confederate veterans find value in the National Park at Gettysburg trying to convince Confederate veterans and former Confederate states to place tablets on the Gettysburg battlefield. He drafts a, a resolution that he tries to sell to some of these former Confederate states, encouraging them, again, to go to the battlefield and place their tablets, mark their lines of battle. Um, he's always giving tours to Confederate veterans who come to the battlefield. He takes Harry Heath around the battlefield. They literally mark the spot where Heath was almost killed in the... Uh, on the first day of the battle. He um, meets James Longstreet many times. They form a kind of friendship. He um, will even meet with lower ranking members of the Army of Northern Virginia and take them out on the battlefield. So his big focus is making sure the story of the Confederate Army is told at Gettysburg. One of the ways he's gonna do it is through avenues on the Confederate side of the battlefield, on Seminary Ridge, on Warfield Ridge, in the shadow of Culp's Hill. So he wants these avenues to be laid out. And these are the same avenues that we still have in the park today. But Robbins is really going to fight for them. And that's not always an easy thing to do. One of the misconceptions I think we sometimes have is that once the battle's over, all the people of Adams County were just really happy to give their land over to the federal government to create a park. That's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. You had some people that were willing sellers. You had some. You had others that, oh, now the federal government wants my land. I'm going to jack the prices way up. There's a lot of that. There are other cases where landowners don't want to sell at all, especially for a road on the Confederate side of the battlefield. And so in William Robbins' writings and his journals, he's constantly in court. He's constantly dealing with condemnation procedures. He's constantly haggling with locals over land acquisitions. And it got so problematic that at one point, John Page Nicholson, the chairman of the, the commission, was going to give up the idea of an avenue on the Confederate side of the battlefield. It was just too difficult to get the land. But Robbins convinced him to, to keep going with it. And ultimately, the avenues, uh, most of them, that Robbins envisioned are created. Even more significant are the tablets that the War Department, the National Park Commission, will place on the battlefield. Marking, again, the location of every brigade, division, corps of both armies and every battalion of artillery. For the Confederate tablets, and of course this is Iverson's brigade out in the first day's battlefield. You can see the Forney farm in the background while it was still standing. A big part of Robin's job is to write these. Robbins is the guy that crafts the language, that tells the story in, in words without praise or censure the story of these individual Confederate brigades. It was an enormous challenge for Robbins. It would be an enormous challenge for any historian, but Robbins is dealing with an event that's in the living memory. And so how does he craft these? He's only got about 15 lines to work with, so an economy of language is, is crucial. But Robbins is going to use the official records of the War of the Rebellion, which were available to him. He's going to have the Southern Historical Society papers, Confederate Veteran Magazine, he is going to correspond extensively with the veterans that fought here to craft these tablets. And that's really Robin's vision for how the Confederate story is going to be told. The avenues and the tablets. When Robbins thinks about the Gettysburg battlefield, I don't think he thought of the North Carolina Monument or the Alabama Memorial or, you know, the Virginia Memorial. That's not what his conception was. His conception was the preserved land on the Confederate side of the battlefield, avenues allowing access, and these tablets placed by the United States government telling the story of the Army of Northern Virginia. That was his big push. He wasn't necessarily looking for regimental monuments to the Army of Northern Virginia the way that Union regimental monuments were placed on the battlefield either. His idea was what he did for his regiment, the 4th Alabama. And I want to say... 1903, 1904, Robbins has this tablet placed on Warfield Ridge. And it is the only one in the park for a Confederate regiment. 
That's because it's the 4th Alabama. That's Robbins Regiment. He drafts the text. He ensures the placement. And that's what Robbins really wanted. He wanted every Confederate regiment in the Army of Northern Virginia to have a tablet just like this that would tell the story of that regiment. Now, where Robbins placed it was on Warfield Ridge, where they formed their initial line of battle. It, it aligned with federal policy. And Robbins really pushed this idea. But most Confederate veterans, while they applauded Robbins' work, while they thought he was doing a good job, and while they were eager to have their story, most of them at Gettysburg told, they didn't necessarily buy into that idea. It's one of the reasons why you don't see him out in the landscape today. A perfect example of this is the story of William C. Oates and the 15th Alabama. We all know who William C. Oates is? Colonel of the 15th Alabama. It's the primary regiment that goes against Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th Maine on Little Round Top. Oates becomes a, um, well, he, he serves throughout the war, severely wounded in 1864. Like Robbins, transfers to a kind of law and political career as governor of Alabama for a brief period of time. During the Spanish-American War, he rejoins the United States Army. Uh, so interesting, interesting guy. But for William C. Oates, Little Round Top was an incredibly important place. That's where his regiment fought on July 2nd. It's one of the great what-ifs of the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, more significantly, that's the battle where William C. Oates loses a brother, John Oates, who's killed, uh, well, mortally wounded, rather, uh, in the fighting on Vincent Spur against the 20th Maine. And it's William C. Oates' dying wish, not his dying wish, but one of his great wishes before he dies, to have a monument placed at Gettysburg honoring the 15th Alabama and his slain brother. And where does he want to place it? Not on Warfield Ridge, where Robin's monument is, where Robin's tablet is. He wants it on Vincent Spur. He wants it at Little Round Top. He wants it where his brother died. That, I mean, you can't hold that against William C. Oates. That makes sense, right? You can't hold it against him. But nobody on the commission, nobody on the commission, even William Robbins, liked that idea. No one. They said, you know, you can, you can have a marker, put it on Warfield Ridge, follow policy. Oates didn't want that. William Robbins was in a very difficult position because, one, he fought on July 2nd about 100 yards from William C. Oates. And now Robbins is thinking, well, you know, my tablet's back on Warfield Ridge. I was following the rules and now the 15th Alabama might get a, a monument on Little Round Top? That's gonna, think, that's gonna cause visitors to think that the 15th Alabama was the only Confederate regiment fighting over there, which wasn't the case. 4th Alabama went up against the 20th Maine too. But because William Robbins fought in an Alabama regiment and was the Confederate commissioner, Oates is going to Robbins to try to get this done. And Robbins wants nothing to do with it. He feels like he's a middleman between the commission and William C. Oates. And so for a while, the commission basically kind of ignore him. They don't answer his letters. Uh, they try to, you know, play things very coolly, hoping the whole thing will just go away. But William C. Oates becomes like a bull in a china shop. He wants that monument. And he's got a lot of political clout, so he goes to his congressman. The next thing you know, William C. Oates, with his congressman and a judge friend, show up to Gettysburg. And they're going to go take a tour of Little Round Top with the commission, and they're going to pick out the spot for the monument. Well, th that day comes. It's in the summer of 1903, I believe. And John Page Nicholson doesn't even show up. Doesn't even show up. So it's William Robbins and the other commissioner, Charles Richardson, who get in a, a buggy with Oates, and they go out to Little Round Top. And um, you know, the other commissioner doesn't even get out of the coach. But William Robbins and William C. Oates, they go to Little Round Top. They talk about the battle. And William Oates... He, I think, was very confused by the way that Little Round Top looked. And his memories of the battle and its ebb and flow didn't really align with what William Robbins remembered. Uh, for example, William C. Oates at one point claims that he drove in the right flank of the 20th Maine. Now, the left flank is the one that they pull back and refuse the line. And if you watch the movie Gettysburg, swung like a door. He's talking about the other flank. And, you know, that really didn't align with history. And so anyways, they leave, they leave Little Round Top that day, and William C. Oates is fairly optimistic. That evening, they go to uh, dinner, and John Page Nicholson shows up, and they're all sitting around a table, I think at the Gettysburg Hotel, and they're talking about the monument. When John Page Nicholson, 
who's been kind of quiet, like I said, he didn't even show up for the tour, he pulls a letter out of his pocket. And guess who the letter was from? Joshua Chamberlain. So John Page Nicholson, who, you know, Robbins might have been a politician, but John Page Nicholson was like the penultimate bureaucrat. He wrote to Joshua Chamberlain about this whole thing. And um, he said, you know, Chamberlain, what do you think about Oates placing this monument? And Chamberlain at first said, oh, as long as it's in accord with history, I don't think I mind it. But then Nicholson started to tell Chamberlain about some of the claims that Oates was making, that they had driven the right flank of the 20th main back, that the whole regiment had been driven up the spur. And Chamberlain's like, no, <laughs> that didn't happen. And so that's what that letter was that Nicholson gives to Oates. And it basically kills it. It kills it. Chamberlain had so much sway as governor, as the savior of Little Round Top, that the, the idea just kind of dies. And that's why you don't have a monument to the 15th Alabama on Little Round Top today. Uh, but these are the kind of battles that William Robbins is engaged in throughout his time as a commissioner at Gettysburg. He's buying land. He's dealing with monuments. He's dealing with veterans. And for a guy that spent four years trying to destroy the United States and create a, you know, a Confederate slaveholding empire, the guy worked for 11 years and he worked his butt off to manage this park. And he always tried to do it in a way that embraced this idea of reconciliation, but did so in alignment and in accord with the, the wishes of the federal government, which was a very fine line for him to walk. But he dedicates his remaining years to this, this mission. As, um, as I've alluded to earlier, his life is marred by tragedy. So if you're keeping track, loses a mother at the age of 14, loses a wife after only three or four years of marriage, leaving him with a, a one-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. He loses that son at the height of the American Civil War at the same time that he loses four brothers. By the first few years of the 1900s, he suffers, again, another string of just unbelievable tragedy. His um, surviving daughter from his first marriage, a woman named Blanche Robbins, uh, gives birth to a child, a grandson, in December of 1903. The child only lives, the grandson only lives one day. One day, and dies. And Robbins would write about that in his journal. He wrote, December 29th, thermometer 33 degrees. We buried today the infant son of my daughter, he was but one day old, one of the most beautiful and large-sized infants I ever saw, and his death was caused by unavoidable hurts received in being born. So something happens there because his daughter then becomes very ill. And uh, one of the treatments that was popular in the 19th century was called cupping. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's usually a glass cup that's heated and placed on the skin. And the idea is to either draw out the toxins or cause a blister to aid in the bleeding process. Well, Robin's daughter undergoes this procedure, apparently, uh, in January of 1904, uh, less than a month after she loses that child. And there's some horrific accident. Some, something happens, and her dress catches fire, and she actually burns to death, or suffers burns so severe they cause her death. And I think those two combined tragedies, the loss of the grandson, and the loss of the daughter exacerbate uh, Robin's already kind of ailing uh, physical condition. And so he, he starts uh, what I would call a slow decline. Uh, he remains active in the commission literally till his dying day. His um, journal that I've talked a little bit about that's been digitized by the University of North Carolina, uh, the last entry in that journal is this. It's April the 15th, 1905. Robbins heads back to North Carolina to try to recover. And he's writing about commission work that day, writing about accepting invitations to dinner and communicating with the other commissioners when all of a sudden his, his penmanship stops and his wife takes over. And the last line is, quote, uh, and this in her, his wife's penmanship, this was the last entry in your journal, my blessed darling, you were too ill to write another line. And Robbins would die the month of May, but a month later. So... You know, the legacy of William Robbins, in a lot of ways, you can still see it out on the battlefield today. The avenues that we use to explore the Confederate side of the, the battlefield on, on Seminary Ridge, South Confederate Avenue, West Confederate Avenue, 
The War Department tablets that you still read, that's Robbins' work. Uh, you know, Robbins believed deeply in Gettysburg as a place of reconciliation. A reconciliation for white people, but a place of reconciliation nonetheless. I, I don't think, as I mentioned earlier, he ever would have envisioned something like the Florida Monument or Mississippi or Louisiana or North Carolina, some of the monuments you see out on the battlefield today. His vision were those individual regimental tablets. You know, history is complex, right? Not everybody wants to be remembered the same way. Like the example between Robbins and William C. Oates over the monument on, on Little Round Top. History is um, not the same thing as memory. Those are two different things, and Robbins' story reminds us of that. More than anything, though, I think the story of William Robbins reminds us that the forces that created the park and molded it were complex, right? As much as it's shaped by history, it's shaped by political gen agendas, by bias, by money, by all of these other factors. Uh, and it's a story, again, the creation of this park, it's a story that is, I think, in so many ways, remarkable, given the fact that between 1861 and 1865, we, we fought so hard to tear the country apart. And I'm going to leave you with one story that I think highlights this. Now, one day, uh, the commission is approached by some veterans from the state of Maine, uh, veterans from the 3rd and 4th Maine. And they had already placed a monument to where they fought on July 2nd, but they wanted to place some uh, advance markers to where they had been positioned on July 3rd, the third day of the battle. Uh, this was a spot on Cemetery Ridge. And it just so happened that that land was owned by the individual you see on the screen in the center, Basil Biggs. Biggs, for those of you that don't know, African-American citizen of Gettysburg. He's a tenant farmer in 1863. He'd been born in Maryland, was an alleged conductor on the Underground Railroad. He's one of the men responsible for exhuming the Union dead on the battlefield and transporting them to the National Cemetery. He's the guy that's physically helping to dig them up. He makes enough money from that job to buy his own farm. Still stands today. It's out on the Tawny Town Road. You can still see it. And by... The 1890s, Biggs had amassed a lot of land, including some of the most famous land on the battlefield on Cemetery Ridge, including the high water mark. And these veterans from the 3rd and 4th Maine need land from Biggs to place their monument. And so they go to the commission to help, to help negotiate this. And who does the commission call upon to go to Biggs's house and sit down and talk about this? They choose the one guy that owns slaves, the one guy that fought in the Confederate Army to go to his house and have this conversation. So I would give anything to be in that stone house and to see this conversation take place between Biggs, former conductor on the Underground Railroad, the man who exhumed Union dead on the battlefield, and William Robbins, major of the 4th Alabama who fought on Little Round Top, who's now a representative of the United States government trying to place a monument to the same guys he was fighting against. That's exactly what happens. The creation of this park is messy. The power dynamics, the, the agendas, the, the previous experiences all come into play to shape this battlefield park. Long story short, big sells the land. And if you ever want to go see those markers, they're just south of the Meat Equestrian statue today. I want to thank you all for your time this afternoon. I appreciate the attention. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. But if not, thank you all so much. Have a good day. Have a safe day. Thank you. Yes. So was Robbins also responsible for the plaques marking the more forward advanced position of the Confederates, like the one to Law's Brigade on Warren Avenue? Or? In some cases, yes. Now, when he dies, the next Southern commissioner, a man by the name of Lunsford Lomax, takes over that, that role. But Robbins writes the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them. Yeah, Teresa? I'm sure of it. I'm sure. Whether or not there's ever been a systematic effort to go out and really review those, at least during the time that the National Park Service has been managing the landscape, I've not seen anything that has done that. I think certainly anecdotally you can go out and say, oh, that's not really right, and you know, that's not really correct. And you know, Robbins might not have had the information that we have today. 
One of the things that we won't do is even if we find information that is wrong, we won't correct it, at least not in bronze, because those are considered part of the park. They're the same things. The, they're, they're just like the monuments that we would protect. They're a historic resource in their own right. Uh, Pennsylvania Memorial is a perfect example of that. We get folks all the time that say, you know, my great granddaddy's name is spelled wrong. Uh, and, you know, part of you wants it to be right on the monument, but at the same time, we treat that as its own historic resource, and so we don't change it. But I, I would be shocked if you went out and read these and didn't find something that was like, oh, I don't know if that's really right. Yeah. Yes, sir? So were these uh, commissioners, these were paid positions? They were. He makes a little over 200 a month. And if you extrapolate it, you're talking about a salary of a little over $100,000 a year in today's money. So that's not bad. I mean, it's not bad. That's not bad. And did he maintain his legal practice at the same no. time? No, 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 no. No, he, he, he really dedicates himself to the commission. He dedicates himself to the commission. Like I said, he gets lodging in, in, in town. He travels back to North Carolina, usually in the wintertime. Um, but you know, primarily, he's in Gettysburg. He takes trips to Antietam a lot. One to visit you know, the battlefield where he fought, but he's actively kind of collaborating with the commissioners there. He, he's very dedicated to his work. Mm. Yeah. But he had um, moved earlier in his life to Alabama. Yes, earlier in his life he had moved to Alabama. He, he just separated from that. Yeah, as far as, as far as I know, he never goes back there in any, in any real capacity. Yeah. He relocates to North Carolina. Yeah. So given his position on, on reconciliation, concurrent with his time here at the battlefield, does he indicate anything in his uh, journals how he feels about the lost cause uh, movement that's been going on, like writings of Jeff Davis, Alexander Stevens, and United Daughters of the Confederacy? Is he get, is, and is he getting any kind of input or ask for from them as in regards to how the, the battlefield is shaping up? Here, here's an interesting story I can tell you. So they would usually trot Robbins out whenever there was speechifying to be done. Uh -huh. And so a lot of times he'll be called out to join uh, GAR gatherings in, in town, either at the courthouse or at the GAR building. And uh, on one occasion, he um, goes to this GAR meeting, and it's a, a gathering of New York veterans. It's a reunion of New Yorkers. And they call upon him to make a speech, which was often the case. And he started to talk about what he thought the causes of the war was. And I think this is really interesting. He said the cause of the war was the differences in the people of the North and the South. And that was attributable to the institution of slavery. So he says that to New Yorkers, which I think is pretty remarkable. He doesn't necessarily try to divorce slavery from the cause of the war, uh, which is not to say that you know, he's this forward-thinking you know, guy when it comes to racial attitudes in the United States, right. as that speech showed you. So he, I think, I think he, he bought into certain tenets of that lost cause myth, but not all of them. Right. Not all of them. He embraced this idea of reconciliation. And when we say reconciliation, you know, I'm going to go meet with these Union veterans, and we're going to shake hands, and we're all going to come together as white Americans now. He bought into that absolutely. Um, but in terms of a lot of these other elements of that lost cause myth, you know, Robbins doesn't really adhere to all of them. I've never read anything where he's throwing Yule under the bus or throwing Longstreet under the bus. He said he actually establishes a pretty good friendship with Longstreet uh, after the war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the, the idea that he was very careful without, uh, uh, I forget the two words used, uh, having to do with being pro or con. Praise or censure? Yeah. So Robbins is not around to see the first state monument to a southern state place. So it's Virginia. There is a pretty, um, pretty intense debate over that monument between the Virginia Commission, who's placing it, and the park. Uh, John Page Nicholson is still alive at this point in time. The initial inscription on the Virginia Memorial was, Virginia to her sons at Gettysburg. You can still see that part. The second line was, they fought for the faith of their fathers. Now, the commission, remember, without praise or censure, 
And when they let, read that line, they're like, oh, I don't know about that. And so they told the Virginia folks, no, you can't have that. You've got to erase that line. And they did. And then also, the initial design for the Virginia Memorial, uh, there's a relief on the front of it, bronze relief, and there's a, a mounted soldier carrying a flag. If you go out there today, it's the Virginia state flag. The original design had a Confederate battle flag, and the commission in 1917 nixed that too. It was so contentious a symbol, even then, that they didn't want it on the battlefield. And so it goes, and so that's what you have out there today. What happens, though, is as the commission kind of loses power, and by that I mean the veterans start to die off, and so you don't have a, a William Robbins or a John Page Nicholson to, to kind of manage these things, you see greater latitude being taken with inscriptions. And by the time of the National Park Service taking over in 1933, you know, that, that without praise or censure is still on the books, but it's not being, it's not being followed, which is why you have, you know, inscriptions on South Carolina and Mississippi and Louisiana and even North Carolina that appear as they do. Would, that, would those have gotten past William Robbins? I don't think so. I don't think so. Would those have gotten past John Page Nicholson? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But that's what you have out there today. It's, that, that phrase is everywhere. It's in our enabling legislation, without praise or censure. If you're a licensed battlefield guide, it's even on the little licensure thing you have to sign every year. You gotta tell the story of the battle without praise or censure. You do that, Teresa, right? So, it's, I mean, that's a big part of the history of this park, those lines. And in a lot of ways, I think they're problematic. They're problematic. Yeah. All right, folks. Oh, one more. Yeah. I, I, if there's a PhD candidate in the, in the room, I'd encourage them, take this up. There's not a lot. There's not a lot. There's been um, a great book written about the National Park Service. Jen Murray uh, wrote that. Um, there's been a little bit written about the GBMA. Uh, Tom Desjardins book, uh, what's, oh, help me, help me. These Honored Dead, thank you. Um, gets into this a little bit, but there is a, such an opportunity for someone to write a book that, that talks about the commission and their management of the park. There's not a lot out there. You know, even Robbins, there's one blog article on the Journal of the Civil War Era. Uh, Scott Hartwig has written a couple of articles on Robbins in um, America's Civil War. But there's been no real study. There's been no real study of, of him. His papers, again, have all been digitized. You can literally go home and start reading through this stuff. And a shout out to the foundation, Gettysburg Foundation. Last year or the year before, during COVID, when they couldn't do their work day out on the battlefield, we provided them with, with JPEGs of the journal and they transcribed it for me, which is the only reason I was able to do this program today. <laughs> so thank you, Foundation. Um, so there's a, a wealth of material available for some serious scholar to do, I think, an amazing study on this chapter in the park's history. Yeah. I think John Manderslice's, uh, he wrote some sort of a history of the GBMA. GBMA, yeah. And that's available out there. I think Gary Adelman, I heard, talk about where he was able to cut and paste from a website. That, uh, you, can, you can find that on Google Books, I believe, as a free PDF. Okay. Uh, and Vanderslice is the union veteran that basically negotiates the hostile takeover of the GBMA away from the locals to now union veterans, GAR. But yeah, nothing, nothing on the, the commission. Nothing on the commission. Thank you all, folks. Have a great day.